Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? This is Lindsay Lerner, and you're listening to The Cost of the Status Quo. More people than ever are questioning why they do what they do and forging their own path. And on this show, I sit down with these entrepreneurs, trailblazers, creatives, and overall awesome beings to discuss the ideas, the opportunities, and the overall tips and tricks they're using so that the rest of us can do the same. This is The Cost of the Status Quo. Elevate your sound game with Filbit, the perfect upgrade for your recording or office space. Our producer, Andrew, has been pushing for a better recording environment. Say goodbye to basic egg crates and hello to stylish felt tiles that not only reduce 35% of ambient noise, but also show off your unique design sense. And the best part, these tiles are made from recycled bottles, making your recording space both stylish and eco-friendly. Get 10% off at feltright.com with code CSQ10. That's CSQ10. Let's give Andrew and you, our listeners, the top-notch sound that you deserve while making a positive impact on the planet. Share your creative Feltright designs with us and join the sustainable sound revolution. Hey there, welcome to The Cost of the Status Quo, where we dive deep into the stories of some of the most innovative and creative minds across industries. Today, we're honored to have the one and only Verite on the show. As a Brooklyn-based singer and songwriter, Verite has made a name for herself with her unique brand of indie, left-of-center pop and alternative music. Her first single, Strange Enough, was released in 2014 and quickly reached number one on Hype Machine. Verite's music has been praised by critics and fans alike, and her live performances are nothing short of mesmerizing. She's toured both nationally and internationally and has graced the stages of festivals such as South by Southwest, Firefly Festival, and Lollapalooza. Join us as we sit down with Verite to hear about her journey to becoming one of the most sought-after artists in the music industry and rising prominence in the Web3 space. From her early days to now, we'll cover it all. Please enjoy the show as we discover the truth behind Verite's music, and don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It truly does help. Can we not talk about it? This prism in my head, deflecting colors like a painting on the wall. Well, we'll dive on in all the way back. Can you tell us a bit about your background and where you grew up? Yeah, so I come from one hour north of New York City, and I'm a musician, and I feel like I always have been since I was a child. I had this innate drive to perform and be an artist and be on stage and be in front of people, but I really lacked context on how to do that well and professionally. <laughs> and so I, you know, when I was a kid, I was hitting up the local open mic circuit with my dad when I was like eight. Then it kind of morphed into me making my own music. So in middle school, I had like an all girl punk band. And then when I was in high school, I started writing music with my cousin, Matt. And Matt and I made this fucking magnum opus, like massively ambitious record. We were actually listening to some of it last night. Just so ambitious and with zero filter and so many unnecessary changes. And all of the songs are six minutes long. But it is the first body of work I can look back on and say, oh, I am proud of this. There, there's a certain quality to it, even though it was maybe naive in its approach. That kind of all led me to starting this project, which I came to relatively late, considering how early I started making music. But I started this project when I was 24 because I had graduated college. I went to college for composition, but really just worked full time and feel like I didn't really get a lot of social benefit or knowledge out of that program. And I moved to the city and I started waiting tables because I didn't know what I was doing and money made sense. Conceptually, I could wrap my fingers around that and really started this project at the point where I was willing to start investing everything I had kind of earned and, and saved from waiting tables relentlessly into myself and into the music. And so when you were doing these open mics, were these like outside of the city or were you coming into Manhattan like with your dad? So when I was younger, it was all upstate stuff. 
And then when I was 16, I started driving into the city and passing demo CDs out with Matt on Bleecker Street and like uh, to all those venues because it's it was right at the precipice. Like a lot of the venues didn't accept email submissions. We were still in CDs land, which is crazy to think about. And so, yeah, when I was 16, we started doing that. And then we booked, I think, our first gig in the city when I was probably 16, 17, and he was 15, 16. What was that? Like earlier you had said, you know, you've always been motivated and driven and considered yourself a musician, but at the same time, you were aimless. What does that mean to you? Did you have this internal sense of creation and creating, and then the business acumen came later? Yeah. So I guess when I say aimless, it's not that I was aimless. It's just that I didn't have a target because I didn't know what the target was. So I was on a mission, but I was just hitting random shit and being like, that is wrong. I think when you're trying to be, you know, an artist or a musician in a professional capacity, you start to realize that the music industry is really small. It's not immediately accessible, not even in the way that it is today, back then. So there was this sense of hoping to get discovered so that somebody would see me on the train and be like, you're a star. That very like American Idol-esque discovery mechanism that isn't really real, or it can be in very rare, rare instances. And so it was a lot of trial and error and thinking, oh, this is it. This is the opportunity. This is the discovery. And then being like, oh, it's not. This is fucking scam. But again, it's because you grow up without the context and knowledge of what the actual industry is. Your dad also is a musician. And so did he have any hopes and dreams of being a professional musician? And were you aspiring towards that? Or was it truly, it was just you and Matt and there was no external guidepost essentially to really chase after, to your point. I think that my dad would have wanted to be a professional musician, but his circumstances were just not conducive to that. You know, he came to the U.S. when he was 15 from Uruguay, worked manual, manual labor construction laying floors for years and years, and then kind of in that was always playing music. And then like Matt and I were in his Latin rock band when we were 16, 17 as well, which was also hitting the club circuit in New York. And so I think, you know, Matt and I just had a really in-depth conversation about how we really owe all of the music that we create to my dad. It was never this external pressure or even expectation of doing it professionally. It was more so my dad was like, be the best you can possibly be. My dad's super intense in the best way of just like, let's fucking go get it done. Like, yeah, go book the gig. And I think for him, Matt and I living out like the grander vision of all of this, like he has nothing but pure and unadulterated, like excitement. Like he is so here for it. And even like, I'll invite him to sound check sometimes. And you've met my dad. He's been in the green room. It's like, my parents are very much like, oh, we're leaving. Like, we don't want to bother you. Go do your thing. So it's one of those things, they're hands off in a way where it's like so supportive and they're so excited, but also they're like, we don't want to be in your shit. What were those early days like before Verite existed? And what, what were some of those thought processes that were going on where eventually it was like, oh no, this is this is it. And this is what I'm going to do. All of these tables that I've waited and all of all of this work, all of this money that I've made, this is what I'm going to invest it in. I, I wish I could be like, there was a light bulb moment, but it was pretty brutal on my psyche because I think that for me, as most things are, that's why I'm an artist. But I think that making music was great. It provided a focus but it was also this very discouraging process. And again, feeling on the outside of everything 
and money made sense. So I really, from the time I was very young, I was just like, I'm gonna make money because this is, you know, cold, hard dollars. It's something clicked in my brain of like money equates to freedom and autonomy, which isn't completely true, but it's also not untrue. While I was in college, I signed a air quote record deal, not a record deal. I am pretty sure it was like a fucking drug front. <laughs> like <laughs> one of the many scams of the music industry. Yeah, it was like I just looking back, I just don't understand the logic of anything. They never released any of the music. It was they just spent money. And so I was very confused. But they offered me five grand. And I was like, this is the most amount of money I've ever seen. Like, let's go. I'm a star. And I had a manager who was also really slimy and was one of those like take off your clothes to be successful kind of humans. And so I was really like, oh, this is my chance. And all of it really fell through. I got really discouraged. And so that was kind of early college. And then I wound up graduating, waiting tables at Applebee's and kind of reclaimed my own creative process in a way while working anywhere from 40 to 80 hours a week, depending on how busy it was. You like to capture the value in Times Square when people are there. In that process, I wound up writing a few songs and connecting with a few people and like producing them out. And I felt really good about them. And I was just like, okay, I'm gonna put some of this savings into this project. And that was like the first pivotal moment, but but the real, moment that I decided to go in fully was I had one song that I made a video for and then I put it on YouTube and I was like hustling it to all these blogs like I sent it to 500 blogs and one blog posted about it and this is in 2014 and it wound up being some UK music industry insider blog I booked meetings for every major label in the UK, every major publisher, to the point where people were like, how did you even get this meeting? And I'm like, I don't know, you invited me, you emailed me to come here. <laughs> was was there any specific, like when you were reaching out to these, I have no doubt that you legitimately emailed 500 people in that. Yeah, without a doubt. And so for you, and I've done this sometimes too, there's no thought process in that in those moments it's just like i am going to find as many contacts as possible and i'm going to outreach one by one did you have any cognitive process of or any sort of system that you were like these are the people that i must connect with or was it just i'm going to harass as many people as possible and get this foot in the door i think it was a bit of the latter though i had like my a list of course the people where i thought people were oh this is cool this is great I really lacked an identity back then. An identity is something that has taken me a long time to really come to terms with and understand within myself. And so I didn't know where I fit. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I had no context for how me or the music I was making fit into like the broader landscape. So it wasn't even like, oh, I, I belong with these blogs. It was like, oh, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm just going to push forward and then find out. And honestly, that's how I've cultivated this whole project and my own identity <laughs> is really just like, okay, the only way to do that is to move forward. How we move forward, you know, there's lots of ways to move forward. No, I don't want to show how I can. How have you gone about building up yourself and your team into really the the business entity that it is now? I would say that the business entity is really Vanessa and I, and then everything else is really on the periphery. Vanessa and I, and then it's like my agent and my lawyer. But it took a while. I really didn't want a manager. Like I said, I had that really slimy manager and, and I had a bad experience with that. And so I didn't want to have another one. And right around the time I had all of this label interest, the producer I was working with sent a bunch of cold emails to managers. And that's how I wound up meeting Vanessa. She was co-managing another artist with another manager. And both of them came on 
and wound up co-managing me. And then eventually I fired the other person and Vanessa stayed. It's a really gradual process. I think that I've definitely made missteps as anyone does, but I think for me, there's been this sense of growing intentionally and at the pace of the project. And I think a lot of the music industry is very top heavy in terms of, all right, we're going to throw $500,000 at this thing that has no traction and hope it sticks. And if it sticks, great, we're going to kind of move you upstream. And if it doesn't stick, we're going to shelve you and ruin your life. Back then, the goal was to sign to a major label, get discovered. The whole, right, I had that similar mentality. And when it shifted to, oh, I'm going to be independent and do this myself, you know, after talking to all those labels, after almost signing to Atlantic, after doing the rounds and then seeing the income I was getting independently, having an understanding that, oh, this is actually sustainable. This is enough to live on and reinvest. This is what I made in a year of waiting tables. It started to shift my perspective. So I think for me, it's grown really intentionally. And sometimes it doesn't grow. Sometimes even like the structures, Vanessa and I have experimented with a lot of teammates, a lot of partners, and recognizing that the core is her and I, and that we can expand into more team members and contract dependent on the climate, right? COVID is a great example. It's this idea of, oh, we're actually going to take it to the, the A-team skeleton crew because we don't know what's going to happen. Why would we want to have all of these people in our orbit? Absolutely. And then for those listeners who may not be as familiar with the music industry, could you touch on briefly the difference in your opinion between an independent artist and truly like what it means to be an indie artist versus an artist who makes the decision to go and sign with a major record label, like you said, Atlantic, Sony, Columbia, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, both are really viable paths and options forward. And the major label system exists in the way that it does because it works when it works and it works extremely well. It is a really well-oiled machine. It's also a gamble of success. And so if you're somebody who wants to gamble and bet on yourself in that way, go for it. But for me, I think really early, I realized that like, I'm not built to play that game. What do I value? I value freedom and autonomy. Going back to, you know, when I was a kid, like my perception of work and money, the idea that I want to create what I want to create. I want to release what I want to release when I want to release it. And I want to be in charge of my own progress and in charge of my own kind of destiny in all of this. And I don't, want to have somebody else owning that process. It's almost less over owning the music, which I own all of my music, which is great, but it's more so owning the process and owning the potential for the future. And so major label, they own the process and they own the music, and then they'll pay you out the royalty post recoupment. So it's a different structure, you know, and there are benefits to each. It's like, you know, I self-funded everything. I am self-funding this record. I am taking on that risk and betting on myself. But ultimately when things go right, when, when we have a good moment, it puts me in a position to win big. So it's like, I am steering my own ship. I'm taking on the risks. Sometimes I hit an iceberg, but for the, I get to own the successes and the failures of the project. And I, I always have the capacity and ability to move forward. Whereas if you're signed to a major label, they really control how and when you move forward. Are there moments in which there is an artist manager relationship? And then there's other moments where you're, you have a friendship and then perhaps there's other moments in which she really is dialed into being the manager and you were really dialed into just being an artist. Or like, how does, how does that flow? It shifts. I think that Vanessa and I are really long-term partners in this and that there is a balance. Her and I achieve that balance really well because we both have a lot of 
mutual respect and understanding for each other as the artist who does have this skeleton crew at times again kind of coming out of covid things shifted right and recognizing that oh just because there aren't the resources to hire everything out all of that work can't go on vanessa so i then have to kind of come and step up and so it's really just being like respectful of each other's roles and respectful of each other's ideas that i think is really important it's that very delicate balance and it shifts so sometimes especially when there's like a lot on the calendar or a montour vanessa is very much like this is in your calendar this is in your calendar she she does a lot of my like i'm going to la she's like reaching out to people to get coffees with all of that stuff but it's something that really does shift and then sometimes i'm doing that for myself because it makes sense or i'm just sending her a list being like hey i want to get coffees with these people can you and so we have a really good back and forth, but it's it's not the same relationship on any given week. I've seen how the two of you interact and I respect and admire that of both of you. And I think that that's really just incredibly badass. And I know that there's a lot and we've even we've interviewed a handful of musicians on this show and some of them are just completely 110 percent independent. They don't want a manager. They don't want help. They're going to do it all themselves. And that's great. And then there's others who are I'm an artist and every single other thing that has to do with business is on somebody else. And so I just appreciate about the two of you that you've navigated that so well. My eyes are wet, it's not a feeling, I just react like it's an instinct drinking from a glass. Over the years, your music has been described as a lot of things, indie pop, electro pop, alternative you, you told me it was left of center pop, which I have stuck on to because I think it's hilarious. How do you describe your sound? And in addition to that, what can your fans expect for future projects? I think the sound is ever evolving. I think that it's pop because there are catchy melodies and a, for, and, and a song structure that is reminiscent of popular music because that's all pop is and pop is like a, an ever changing word and then i am just not really down the middle i don't want to make radio music tailored for the radio i don't want to make algorithm music that's tailored to the algorithm and so really viewing what i create as art that exists in in whatever world that i build around it and so that's kind of the left of center it's like okay, we're not aiming towards what is mainstream, but we are existing in that realm because that is what I write. And even more recently, it's like, how do I view the music I create as a living and breathing entity and less so a series of decisions that I make and release? And so that's kind of coming out in generative projects and how do we create limitless combinations of a song so that every time you play it back, you're hearing a different version I'm really interested in like AI music now and, and how do I utilize those tools to create a different experience for people. And so it's almost less about like, what does it sound like? And more so what's the experience around it and what's the feeling that people get from it? That's fantastic. And so, I mean, to touch on AI, you've spent a lot of time, especially during COVID and recently in the Web3 space. What was it about it that drew you in and what's keeping you playing in that that space that's a world that has grown and shifted and changed and is in so much flux because it's new i mean it's not really new but i think that it's more mainstream adoption is new and for me what drew me to it was this idea that culturally we don't value music my partner always says it's it's like the wallpaper on TikTok, right? It's not, <laughs> which is which is so brilliant. That hits. But it is, it's not the focus and it's not valued and the marketplace is so oversaturated and you can't even expect people to listen to it. Not even listen, to engage with it on a deeper level because even I think of how I listen to music, there's too much. There's too much. You can't be a fan of every project. And so how do you navigate one, the fact that 
people don't value music. They don't want to pay for it. They don't pay for it. We listen on Spotify for free, et cetera. And how do we also create more impactful and lasting relationships with the people who listen to our music? And so those were the problems that I was seeing, especially again, moving into COVID, which, you know, my tour got canceled 10 days into a 40 day tour, all of the impacts of that. And then it effectively ended my second record cycle because there was nothing to do. Couldn't really sit and chill your music. People were dying. It really forced me to sit back and recognize that, okay, the, the systems and platforms that I have used to build my career are no longer viable options moving forward for growth. And when I looked to the blockchain and the world of Web3, what I saw was an opportunity to restructure how we value music through the creation of digital scarcity. And so this idea that music is free and accessible for all to listen to, and I think that is a beautiful thing. I'm actually not opposed to that. But what if we could create different tiers of value above free for those who want to participate in a different mechanism in a different way? And so a lot of that I've been experimenting with really high value one of one music pieces that I mint on the blockchain that essentially is the official signed copy of that that exists digitally. One of my favorite metaphors is, is the metaphor of Mona Lisa. There's one painting, but everybody can go look at an image of the Mona Lisa online for free. The Mona Lisa is actually owned by the people of France. It's owned by everyone. So there's a collective ownership of one really valuable asset that is then proliferated across the entire globe that I could buy a high resolution $100 print, or I can print that shit out on my printer and tack it on my wall. So there are all of these tiers of value to this one asset. And so viewing the experiments that I've been running in Web3 as playing with the value of music and, and what, what do people value? What do pe people want to spend their money on as collectibles? And how does that impact the funnel of value as, as we kind of go from high value to fully accessible? And I love what you said about it being truly experimentation. Was that something that you either solo or with Vanessa really thought of as like, we are going to run a series of experiments to see what works, or is that more so the style in which you work? I think that's the style in which I work. It's the style in which I run my regular project. I really turned to Vanessa and I was like, hey, this, like, I think we need to do this. And she was a little, not skeptical at first, but I think she was like, I want to learn more. She was skeptical because she didn't know and I was just learning. And so I think once she learned a bit, she was like, all right, cool, let's go. And then it really has become a, a series of, you know, two years of experiments, most of which have been really successful. Everything that I've put out has sold, which is cool. And just this idea of, I don't know what's valuable. I think that a lot of, especially artists, talk about the value of music. Like, it's so valuable. It's the most valuable. And I'm like, maybe. I think that we sometimes conflate sentimental value with tangible monetary value. And sentimental value is limitless and monetary value is finite. It is how much is someone willing to open their wallet to spend on something. And... I've been just super upfront that this is an experiment. I don't know what this will yield. I don't know what has value, but I'm going to decide that one of one music NFTs of my songs are high value. And if you don't want to buy them, don't buy them. But I'm not going to price them down to the market. I'm going to keep them as this, again, fine art. <sighs> You're blowing my mind as usual. As fucking usual. And so I really like how you differentiated that sentimental value versus monetary value. And so how do you, as an artist, as someone who's like ripping out their heart and soul to create the work that you do, when you're making that decision to put a price tag on it, what is that process? And if you've had a, a wild amount of success so far, 
what happens if someone doesn't meet you in that space? Is that a business hat? Is that an <laughs> artist hat? Like, how do you differentiate those two things? Because it's so personal. When I started, I didn't price anything. I allowed everything to be open bidding. And I allowed people to bid whatever they wanted. And I gave a timeline and I said, I'm going to choose the highest bid in 48 hours. And I did that a few times. And I saw the first time someone bought something was for one ETH, which was $1,800. And I was just like, but literally my response was, why? That's so dumb. I was like, I'll take it, but I don't, I didn't understand. Cause again, I didn't, I didn't have the experience or the strategy that I now have in place based on my experience. And then the second thing I did, someone bid five ETH with no competition. It wasn't a rolling up. It was, I'm bidding five ETH and I accepted it. And for me, it was another, oh, and then I had an interaction with this individual who was very clear on why they were doing it because they loved the project and they loved that I was experimenting in this world and they wanted me to have the financial freedom. It's patronage in, in this new way. And, you know, that 5 ETH at that time was like 10 grand for a song that had been released and out for years. And so it started to shape a little bit more. And the third thing I sold was for a song called By Now, where I was seeing that the value proposition of purely digital assets was going to be hyper niche for people who understood and were already in this world. And I was curious what would resonate with fans. And so I sold a percentage of master royalty ownership with the NFT as a promise, essentially. I again, let it be open bidding. And I said a million dollar valuation. So a million dollars got you a hundred percent, et cetera, coming down. And I wound up selling 2.3% at 11 ETH for 23K. And so those first three things had no reserve. They were just experimenting with, all right, well, what does the market say, right? What is, what are they pricing it out? And then from there, I felt like I had really established myself and moving into this year, I made a decision that my experiments in this world were going to have two very distinct pillars. One is high value scarcity, an actual use case and benefit of blockchain technology, the creation of digital scarcity. So all of my one of ones are reserved at five ETH. Buy it, don't buy it. I actually don't care. Not that I don't care, but I'm not going to sell you on it. If you're interested, it is there for you. And then the other is actually f not monetarily focused, but purely focused on accessibility and understanding my audience. And we're so far away from mass adoption. So a lot of even these experiments, they're not practically useful yet, but more so understanding what are the problems and what are the solutions. I don't know who comes to my shows. We can, so we built something with a company called IYK called Guestbook where you tap your phone, you claim an NFT, it's proof of attendance. And then how can I use that information to then create a better reward system for my fans that isn't dependent on a middleman, that isn't dependent on Ticketmaster, Live Nation, or even a platform that can go down. And so this idea of wanting to give things to my fans give them experiences. So we also did a crew neck also with IYK, which is a company that I've been working with for over a year now. Essentially, that is proof of authentication of goods. So we did a crew neck that was embedded with an NFC chip. And that NFC trip chip is premier access to the next era of Verite. And you tap your phone and I have a song coming out Thursday, you're going to get to hear it tomorrow on Tuesday. So this idea of, all right, we have a sweatshirt. It's a nice sweatshirt, but we're adding additional value to the sweatshirt via experience. And then if you want to go all the way through the process, which is an option, not a necessity, you can claim that sweatshirt as an NFT, which is essentially your digital certificate of authentication. And in the future, how cool would it be that, let's say I wanted to sell that sweatshirt, that I'm actually selling it on chain. And then there's a 
transparent ledger of transactions that shows that it came from me to you, Lindsay, to now who you're selling it to. And this idea that, okay, we are actually proving the provenance of goods and we can prove the provenance of digital assets as well. And so with all of that, where it intersects is kind of where I've been playing. And then there's so many more opportunities, but for me, it's been really helpful to distill, okay, these are the two pillars of strategy and then what can come from those. Cause otherwise it's a clusterfuck. Everyone is, everyone's doing a million things and it's so easy to get lost. I'd love to spend a couple of minutes before we wrap up just talking about your experiences touring and what that experience is like of being on the road, the ups and downs, and then how additionally, how you're really integrating to your point about your project with IYK and other projects that you're going to do in the future, how you're intersecting the Web3 space with the real life (laughs) space. Yeah. I mean, I love touring, as you know. I feel like I am my optimal self on tour. You have a a goal every night. You have a broader goal to put on the best show as possible. And that's really all that matters above everything else, above sleep, above comfort. It's like, we're here to put on a show. This is the job. And it's this collective understanding that that's the job. And I love that and I'm here for it. And I think to tour, you have to love the best parts of it and the worst parts of it equally. This idea of connection is so important. And I feel very disconnected a lot of moments of my life. I feel like it is this really immense privilege to have the music that I create resonate with people and to be able to share an experience with that. I just like to have fun. And I really value these people. Like my fans are dope. They're funny. They're smart. They respect boundaries. Very rarely do I have someone not respect a boundary or like not be able to read the room. The intersection of how we exist in the real world, merging with how we exist digitally is like really interesting because we're living most of our lives online. And there's a lot of talk about the the metaverse. A lot of that is just like really bad graphics and digital worlds. A lot of that still has not been fully fleshed out. But if we take that concept to social media, like that's a metaverse of sorts. It's a whole digital economy, digital identity that we're kind of putting on. And I think for me, I'm really uninterested in creating a digital identity that doesn't have ties to like real world experiences. Otherwise I would just be a catfish and just become be the best fake version of myself. But for me, how all of this blends into real life. And so it's really made me question all of the effort that we put into these platforms that also don't give a shit about us that we add value to, that we, you know, Instagram only exists because of its users. Spotify only exists because of its artists. And this idea that none of that value actually flows back to the end user. It doesn't flow back to the people that make that experience great. When I look at touring, it's how can I create a new experience for people who come to shows and then reward them for making the experience great? We're really far off from that working in like a large scale practical way because people haven't adopted the technology. The UI is really bad, but a lot of what I'm doing now feels like it's laying the groundwork for the utopia that I envision, which is artists essentially become their own platforms in a way. I mean, we already are our own platforms in a lot of ways, but that there are mutually aligned incentives and benefits for fans to participate in an artist project that feed back down either through experience or through the creation of a secondary economy, micro economy that exists through token exchanges, through NFT exchanges that then get you access to different experiences. What would it be like if you took all of these social actions and that benefited the project, gained tokens from those actions and somebody who has money but doesn't really have the time 
to do all of that buys those tokens from you for this experience. It's creating a symbiotic relationship between artists and fans. And I think that that, again, farther off, but it is a bit of the utopia. And for instance, it would look like I use Instagram and I have all these followers and I create these meaningful experiences. Like I actually have equity in the project that I am supporting. And this idea of breaking down the hierarchy of not even ownership, but of value that gets created. I think it's a lack of education and understanding from the user perspective as well and from the fan perspective, because they don't understand when they go on Ticketmaster or Live Nation or any of these big behemoths, they don't understand that when they put their email in, you're not getting that. Oh, yeah. No idea. No concept. That's, I think, what's really, really interesting about what you've done with the guest book and what's so powerful with the guest book is letting your fans let you know who exactly was there, not just, okay, that's great. You know, we sold out a show. Yay for selling out a show, but like who the hell was there and, and why were they there and being able to create that, that interaction. For our final question that we ask every lovely person who comes on the show, what is the worst piece of advice they've ever gotten? And of course, what is the best piece of advice? Worst piece of advice? I mean, maybe it's not advice per se, but like this idea that just because it's more expensive, it's better. That's not how it works. But I think there's a lot of, oh, if you need an asset created, if you need some, a video created, the more expensive it is, the more effective it's going to be. And I think that that's bullshit. That great strategy and intention beats expensive asset making or expensive work 10 out of 10 times. And there's been multiple times in my career where I was just like, oh, I did the more expensive thing and I regret it because it didn't have the desired outcome. That's the worst piece of advice. And then the best piece of advice was definitely to quit my job or quit music. That was my mom. She was just like, if you're not going to quit your job and go into this full time, you should just do something else. She gave me The Dip by, what is it, Seth Godin, which is basically this graph where you start off doing something and it's fun. And then whatever you do, there's a dip you kind of fall into the hole of it and it's really hard. And then you can climb out of the dip, you can climb out of the hole, but it's gonna be really hard and take a long time. And basically said, if you're not willing to put in the work to get out of the dip, you should fucking quit and do something else. And it really resonated with me. So I quit my job and I went into music full time and then I made it work. And then you had, you know, your billboard in Times Square, right? Yeah, right that by was, the Applebee's that you had <laughs> waited tables at. That was nice. That was necessary. You know what I mean? Yes. Hell yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you for sharing your stories, your tips, your tricks, all the things today. Appreciate you for being here. Thank you for having me. This was fun. No, I don't want to. So Thank you for listening to The Cost of the Status Quo and learning the wisdom, stories, and ideas that will have you feeling inspired and ready to take on the world. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to share, rate, and review. It means the world to me and the team putting it all together. If you're looking for more information, you can find us at costofthestatusquo.com or on Instagram at costofthestatusquo. If you've got any questions or curiosity about me, you can find me at lindsaylearner.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-L-E-R-N-E-R.com or on Instagram at lindsaylearner. Thanks again for listening. Hope you have an awesome day.